You know, I said last week that sometimes when you research one thing, you get tipped off to another thing worth investigating. And my episode on the New Wave movement a few weeks ago has been a veritable horn of plenty in that department. First leading us to the Altamont Free Concert of 1969 last week, and today flashing us forward 10 years to a fateful night in 1979 when rock and roll went after disco at Comiskey Park in Chicago. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. July 12, 1979. The Chicago White Sox are in the midst of what is a pretty down season. Teams not playing well. Teams not winning. People aren't coming to the games. So the powers that be at the Chicago White Sox take a look around and say, we got to get some butts in these seats. How are we going to do that? And we want to get young butts in these seats. We want to cultivate a new generation of fans. Some new young people who can come out to the ball game and see what a good time it is. And so in order to do that, they look across Chicago and they seize a rock DJ called Steve Dahl, who seems to be amassing a rather large following as the leader of the local Disco Sucks movement. All right, this is 1979. Disco is peeking out, and there's a rock DJ who don't like it, and he's leading an army of people he calls co-hos who are anti-disco and anti-disco movement, and who better to get to come into your ballpark with his army of followers than a rock DJ called Steve Dahl for a promotion they're going to call Disco Demolition Night. Do you know about Disco Demolition Night, kids? The concept here is we're going to have Steve Dahl, leader of the anti-disco movement, Come out between games on a twilight doubleheader. Sox versus the Detroit Tigers. We're going to have Steve Dahl blow up, literally explode, a bunch of disco records. Sounds like a good time, don't it? That'll bring the kids out, don't you think? What's interesting about this for me is that these events... If you want them to, and that's history, kids. You know, I gotta be clear about this. History is a lot of times, if you want it to, meaning you interpret things as you see them, sometimes you interpret things as you want to see them. I try to present a fair and balanced presentation here. I am not a professional historian, though I do have a degree in the subject, for what it's worth. <laughs> but if you want to look at these events, they sometimes point to deeper cultural social stuff, all right? Altamont was that, even New Wave was that. And so you look at a promotion like the Disco Demolition Night, and you think it's a goofy thing. But then you dig just a little bit deeper, all right? And you look at Disco Sucks. This movement that was happening in opposition to a flourishing disco scene in the late 70s, all right? Now, this is where it gets interesting, because some people say Disco Sucks was just rock fans fighting back. And in many cases, probably that was true. But there are other people who argue something far more sinister. That Disco Sucks was a racist, homophobic, sexist reaction by mostly white middle class America to cultural and social changes that were happening in the 70s. And those changes are in some ways epitomized by the disco subculture. 
This is the really interesting part, kids, because a lot of what we find in the disco subculture can be traced right back to the 1960s counterculture movement that we talked about last week. Now, last time around, we considered the notion that the 1960s counterculture ended at the Altamont Free Concert in December of 1969. Some people think that, all right? Other people think it ended when Vietnam ended, or with the Watergate scandal and Nixon's resignation in 1974, whenever the stuff that the counterculture was countering went away. <laughs> I don't have a good answer to when the counterculture ended, but what I have seen in my research, in my travels, on the History Highway, is that while the counterculture might have dissolved, and it did, a lot of its ideas, and its people, found their way underground to the massively growing dance club scene in a lot of the big American cities in the 70s. These ideas about a harmonious and peaceful community, about diversity, about equality, about the freedom to explore and express yourself in whatever ways feel right to you. These were the hallmarks of the 60s counterculture, part of it, all right, part of it, this notion of individual expression and freedom and equality for diversity, for feminism, all this stuff, this comes out of the counterculture. And what we see when we jump forward is that this is happening in the dance clubs, the disco techs, the discos that were coming along in the early and mid 70s, okay? Disco culture was about freedom. And for some folks out there, for whom disco sucks was more than just rock fans being rock fans, a lot of the problem was that these principles in the disco culture seem to have been driven by the gay community, all right? Now let's look back here. In the 1970s, in a lot of places, it was still illegal to be gay. Homosexuality was quite literally a crime. <laughs> And gay people were having a tough time, all right? Gay people still have a tough time. Imagine 40 or 50 years ago, okay? In some places, two men weren't allowed legally to dance together unless there was a woman present. <laughs> I read that gay men used to go out in some places on a Friday night and take bail money with them because there was a pretty good chance of being arrested out there. Or if they didn't get arrested... You know, if they were hanging around clubs that were known to be gay clubs, they could reasonably expect to be hassled or even attacked, all right? It's not easy to be a gay person in the 70s. And so what begins to happen is that they begin to have, this community begins to have private dance parties, all right? These are not public clubs. These are private dance parties where these folks can just get together and be themselves without fear of being attacked, accosted, hassled, arrested. <laughs> so, you know, you can trace some of the roots back to these kind of private parties that people were having just to feel safe. And eventually these parties got bigger and they started to move into clubs, all right? And this is the mid-70s and they're beginning to enjoy this music and... People are joining the movement, all right, because there's a freedom there, all right? And, you know, another problem for those sinister disco sucks people is that the sexual revolution is in full swing, all right? You've got the feminist movement happening. We talked about birth control, the pill coming along in 1960, right? Divorce is becoming a more accepted thing. Sexuality outside of marriage is becoming a a more accepted thing, thanks in large part to the 60s counterculture. Remember, we're countering the principles of the 50s and the 40s and that generation, right? The baby boomers are rejecting a lot of that stuff because it leads to things like wars and nuclear holocaust and consumerism and competition and all this stuff that goes against this notion of a collective community that we want to build together. And all that stuff burned out, but in the disco clubs that are popping up, kind of the underground scene, middle 1970s, 
this stuff still exists. We have there a community where people can go and they can be themselves and they can dance and they can express themselves. And if they're gay, that's okay. And there's ethnic diversity in these clubs and that's okay. And women are there, men are there, and you can be who you are and just dance, man. And yeah, the sexual revolution is happening. The sexual revolution is in full swing, kids, and I use that term deliberately because swingers clubs were popping up in the 70s. Oh, yeah. Key parties. It was a scene, man. So you've got people opening up to new notions of what's okay, sexually speaking. Premarital, extramarital sex, this kind of stuff. And this notion of exploring your sexuality and free love, the stuff that the 60s counterculture was talking about, carries over into the disco scene, man. And this becomes a feature of the disco world, okay? And for a lot of people have a problem with this. They're hearing the rumors <laughs> that you can go to the disco and you can dance on the floor, but in the darker areas of the club, there's stuff going on that a lot of people think shouldn't be going on. And some of these places were pretty much fronts for full-on sex clubs, all right? <laughs> I'm not denying that. This was a world of hedonism. This was a world of letting go. This was a world of indulgence. Because the 70s were tough, man. This is not the 50s. This is not the 60s. The boom is over. So you've got high unemployment, you've got inflation, real wages are not actually increasing, you've got the president that's a crook, you've got the OPEC crisis. Life is hard, man! And so, yeah, we want to escape. We want to get away from all of this misery and all this difficult stuff that's going on, and we want to dance to the music, and we want to have sex with whoever we want to have sex with, and we want to be free, and we want to uh, be us, and we want to get away from it all. We want to escape, man. That was the disco culture. And you know what? The punks, the punks had a problem with that. <laughs> Let's pull those punks back in again, man. Because the punks looked at the disco world and thought, you guys are abdicating your responsibility. Things suck, and your answer is to roll over and escape and get away. Our answer is to confront. You know, we want to attack the problems in society. You guys just want to get away from it all and escape. You're running away from it, man. But the disco people did not care about that. They wanted to dress up on Saturday night in their flashy disco clothes, you know, their hot pants and their platform shoes. And they wanted to wear big lapels and have their shirts open all the way down so you could see all that chest hair, man. And they wanted to go dance with who they could dance with. And they wanted to go fool around with who they could fool around with. And they wanted to do this with impunity and freedom. And they wanted to escape, man. And do you know what helps you escape? Quaaludes, man. <laughs> and do you know what makes it so you can stay up all night, enjoying the music, enjoying the dance, getting it lost in it all? Cocaine, man. <laughs> yeah, the 60s counterculture drug scene happening hardcore in the 70s, all right? People in the LSD, people doing acid, people taking quaaludes, people doing coke. This is a hedonistic festival, man. And if there's one thing that white middle-class America doesn't like, it's hedonism, man. <laughs> So they see this all happening in these clubs. These people are going there and they're having promiscuous sex and they're doing drugs and they're dancing. We can't have that. All this is a scandal, man. It's from the outside looking in. You've got these drugged out gay sexual hedonists making a mockery of everything we hold sacred. And we haven't even talked about the music yet. What about the music? The music? comes out of funk, man. It comes out of R&B. It comes out of blues. It comes out of Latin sounds. None of this is white. You know what I mean? All of this is coming from places that aren't white. This is not rock and roll. And so there are people who argue that disco sucks and the disco backlash. If it's not a shot at sexual hedonism, if it's not a shot at 
gay culture if it's not homophobic. Maybe it's racist because this music, you know, comes out of the black world or comes out of the Latin world. Comes out of funk, man. Motown, this kind of stuff. Some people argue that Disco Sucks was motivated by those racial undertones. Or overtones, you know? And other people say, you know what? This music just sucks. It's super overproduced. It's formulaic. It's commercial. It's BS, man. The purists look at it and say, this is way too produced. This is obviously simply designed for mass market. You know what I mean? And we don't like it. And all of that wraps up into disco sucks, man. Because rock and rollers are looking around and they're saying, hey, everything is disco all of a sudden. And this was underground for a while. You know, early to mid-70s, this is an underground phenomenon. And then something happens that tilts the balance, kids. 1977. Don't they release a little film called Saturday Night Fever? John Travolta, man, the whole disco thing not only comes, you know, into the mainstream consciousness with that soundtrack loaded with Bee Gees songs, some people say it all of a sudden makes disco and disco culture okay for straight white men. <laughs> and that is the death knell of disco, right? Because once it becomes acceptable to white straight men, the whole thing is lost. The whole principle is lost, you know? Once the mainstream takes it over, the whole principle gets denied. But it blows up, man! 1977, 1978, 1979, it's disco, 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 disco! Disco everywhere, man. People dance into the music. It's on the charts. It's on the radio. And what you begin to see happening is that rock format stations that aren't doing that well begin to flip to disco overnight. Including WDAI in Chicago, which on Christmas Eve 1978 flipped format to disco and suddenly put its staff out of work, including a DJ called Steve Dahl. Oh, you can feel the threads beginning to weave together. Steve Dahl gets let go and his station goes disco. And so he hangs around for a little bit, and then he gets hired by WLUP Loop 98, the Loop Kids. The rival station that's playing rock and roll in Chicago after WDAI went disco. And so Steve Dahl begins this Disco Sucks campaign, becomes kind of the spokesperson for that as things are ramping up, you know. 78, 79, disco is everywhere, rock fans are disgruntled, and there might just be an undercurrent of folks who don't like this notion of gay black music. <laughs> beginning to infiltrate the airwaves and our communities. I'm not, you know, I'm not arguing this way or that. I'm merely looking at Disco Sucks as a phenomenon here. And I've read people who said that's what it's about. I don't know if it was about that or not. I think for most people, it was simply about, we hate that this music is mainstream and our rock stations are getting turned over and we want to fight back. Fight for rock like Warlock said, man. Doro Pesh. I'm just presenting history as I've read it. I don't know if it's true or not. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. In any case, by 1979, you've got Steve Dahl shuttled out of his radio station, out of his job by the disco, leading the Disco Sucks movement in Chicago. And there were events happening all over the place, you know? Disco Sucks was a thing. It was a backlash, for sure. And for a lot of people, I think it was just fun. <laughs> no racist, homophobic, or anything kind of undertones. Just fun. You know, rock and roll fans being rock and roll fans. But the White Sox ownership, 1979, looking at a dreadful season and an empty ballpark, looks over at Steve Dahl and says, hey, that dude's got a following of young people. Can we get him 
to the ball game. And so the deal is worked out. All right, we got a doubleheader on July 12th. We're going to have Steve Dahl from The Loop come out, and we're going to get him to blow up some disco records. So if you want to see that in person, all you got to do is bring a disco record and pay us 98 cents, and you can walk right in. Bring a disco record, and the ticket is a buck. Wow, who could pass that up? Now, the Sox are drawing like 15,000 people to a game, okay? In a stadium that holds like 44, 45. It's empty, right? And they're thinking, we'll do this promotion. Maybe another 5,000 people will come, you know? Maybe another 5,000 kids will show up. We'll have 20,000 in the park. Maybe have 5,000 new people we can reach and show them what a good time the ball game is. Something happens that they weren't expecting, though, kids. Early on in the day, as we're getting ready for the game, we can see that there's a lot of traffic around Comiskey Park, all right? Now, they had security enough for 35,000 people, all right? I thought, we'll probably get to get to 20, but we'll have a little bit extra just in case, right? The game sells out. <laughs> So there's 40,000 plus in the stands, you know, at least half of which, probably more, are Steve Dahl guys there to blow up disco, all right? So it's a bit rowdy. And what happens is at the gates, they've put the bins out where you put in your record and then you go to your seat, right? Well, the bins begin to overflow. And so people can't put the records in there, so they keep the records. And they take them into the stands with them. Ooh, that might be a problem later. <laughs> Especially when you don't have the Hells Angels running security, you know what I mean? So the games get started, and there's still like 20,000 people outside the stadium, right? And things up in the bleachers, you know, up in the cheap seats, up in the nosebleeds are beginning to get a bit raucous. People are drinking the beer, they're having a good time, and then word goes around to security that folks are starting to break in. We're at capacity, kids. We have not got enough security down there to stop people just jumping over the turnstiles and coming in. They're coming through holes in the outfield wall. You know, they're just beginning to power past all of the ticket checkers and security and all that stuff. They're just starting to come in. And they find that there are certain gates that aren't even really manned by anybody. They're just walking in. So all of a sudden, this park is, we're over 50,000. You know, we're like 55,000. People are just coming in. And if there's anything we know, that maybe apart from Woodstock 1969, when people start storming the barricades, an air of revolution begins to pervade. You know what I mean? So word goes around to security that people are beginning to bust into the park. So they leave, you know, the upper deck, the nosebleeds, the security people do, and they sort of run down to the gates to try and stop the tide of people just busting their way in. And what happens when the cat's away, kids? Those people up in the bleachers, realizing that there's no security, start throwing records that they couldn't put in the bins. I want you to imagine the damage that a vinyl record can do thrown from the top bleacher at the field. It's like a Frisbee, but sharper. <laughs> and so the players on the field are like, what is happening? It's beginning to rain records. And they're just like winging down from the, from the stands and like sticking in the ground like lawn darts. You know, players are on the field, and these vinyl records are whooshing past their heads. You could kill somebody with one of these things, man. And they're ducking and diving and whipping into the audience. And then they start throwing lighters, and they're throwing bottles, kids. Because back in the 70s, you could have a bottle at the game. You ruined it for all of us, you people at Comiskey Park, because we can't have bottles anymore. You know what I mean? So a chaos is beginning to descend. And the players on the field are like, we should probably wear batting helmets as we're in the outfield because it's literally raining lighters and bottles and people are chucking vinyl records across the field. 
this is not okay. And everything is packed. Like 10 or 15,000 people just busted in. They're sitting in the aisles. We got way, way too many people here, man. And they are not baseball fans, all right? They are rock and roll fans, followers of Steve Dahl, who want to see something get blown up, and they've busted their way in. So they're high on adrenaline, they're high on possibility, and they're looking for a little mayhem. And doesn't history provide mayhem when it gets the opportunity? So we fast forward to the end of the first game, won by the Tigers, 4-1, nobody cares. And then the doors open, and out comes Steve Dahl. And he's wearing, like, fatigues. <laughs> he's the head of an army, the co hos man. And we hate disco, and we're going to blow it up right now. And he's driving around in a Jeep, and people are just throwing stuff at him. Throwing bottles, throwing lighters, and this is, you know, considered by him a great sign of respect. <laughs> you know, my faithful, this great messiah, and they're being rowdy because that's what we do in rock and roll, right? And then they bring out this big bin. You can see this on YouTube. There's lots of coverage of this. You can watch this happen. They bring out this big bin of records, full of disco records, man. And they put it out in center field. And there's Steve Dahl, and he gives like a rallying cry, and they start the Disco Sucks chant, Disco Sucks chant. We're having the biggest anti-disco protest of all time! And the crowd goes wild. And there are like regular customers in the audience, regular season ticket people, you know, baseball fans. And they're looking around like, there's mayhem unfolding here. <laughs> This is not feeling safe. This is feeling just a little bit Altamont. You know what I mean? And they begin to get up and try to leave. But you can't even get through the people. It's just packed. And so Steve Dahl lights the fuse and literally explodes this bin full of records. And it's mayhem. This massive explosion rips a huge hole in center field. It's a shell crater. It's an explosion, man. It's wired with explosives. And they blow this thing. And there's just debris everywhere. And the people are going crazy. And they're throwing more stuff. And there's a hole in center field. And then a couple people just jump onto the field. Why wouldn't you? We're having a revolution here. And we're drunk and we broke in. And there are no rules anymore. You know, civil society... It's a knife edge, kids. It hangs by a thread. <laughs> a couple people get on the field. They, they run and slide into second base. Nobody really stops them. Then a couple more, then a couple more, then a couple more. And then suddenly, upwards of five to 7,000 people are on the pitch at Comiskey Park just going crazy. They stole the bases. They dug up home plate. They're destroying stuff. They're climbing the foul poles. This is not safe behavior, kids, all right? And there ain't enough security to do anything about it. And they got Harry Carey. You know, the famous baseball announcer is working in, he's like the park announcer for, the, for Comiskey at that point. And he's trying to get people to calm down and go back to their seats. And then he tries to lead a round of take me out to the ball game. Because ain't baseball fun, man? Baseball is quite literally a riot. <laughs> and this is going on, and they cannot get these people to calm down. They are destroying Comiskey Park. They stole the bases. They're climbing the foul poles. Security can't do anything. It's mayhem on the field. And they got to call in the freaking riot police. <laughs> This goes on for like 40 minutes. People just going hog wild on the field at Comiskey Park, destroying everything. And then finally the riot police come. They're in full riot gear, man. They got the shields, they got the whole thing, and they're going after them. And the anti-disco people just scatter. <laughs> just scatter like mice. Whoosh, gone. And they got cops chasing them, and they bust out, and they're gone. And they arrest 39 people for disorderly conduct. Thankfully, nobody seriously hurt, but they arrest 39 people for disorderly. And when all is said and done, they get the people off the field, 
the field is a war zone. There's a huge hole in center field where they blew up the, the records. The grass is torn up. Home plate is gone. And they're like, we can't play this. Like the grounds crew comes out, tries to fix like the third base line, <laughs> put down new chalk. And they're like, we'll, we'll rake it up and we'll see if we can fix it. And they're not doing this long before it's like, we can't fix this. We cannot play baseball here, all right? We have to forfeit the second game. The Sox have to forfeit the second game because Disco Demolition Night went crazy. And you know, there's lessons in this, all right? There's lessons in this. There's lessons in Altamont. And the main lesson is plan things. <laughs> What they did not have in either of those cases is somebody who says, what's the worst that could happen? Now, I'm a communications professional, all right? My professional life was in PR and communications. And so it's my job to look at things and say, what's the worst that could happen? So I'm kind of tuned to that. And that's not always a healthy thing, by the way, especially when you're going to get on an airplane. Nobody seemed to have stopped and said, hey, what's the worst that could happen in this scenario? Having the Hells Angels here drinking beer for payment. What's the worst thing that could happen there? Bringing in a bunch of people and grossly underestimating the number and letting them walk into the stands with vinyl records. What's the worst that could happen if we explode things to a raucous crowd of people? particularly young rock and roll fans. What's the worst that could happen? Nobody seems to have asked that question, but you know, the flip side of that, this disaster at Comiskey Park, the worst baseball promotion of all time, by certain metrics. <laughs> but if you flip it around and you're like, well, this is a guy on a podcast, 40 years later talking about this, pretty good promotion, man. Beats the crap out of the Shopsy's wiener guy running the bases or whatever that's about. So I don't know. But I'm just saying, have enough security. Consider, consider the potential consequences of what you're organizing here. <laughs> and be prepared for that, all right? And of course, it, this was a huge, huge news thing. Like, this was all over TV, all over the papers. What a disgrace this is that the kids are so crazy protesting this disco music and that subculture that's so hedonistic and sinful. It's just a big old vat of toxic here. And Steve Dahl's loving it, by the way. He's on the radio the next morning reading the headlines, you know, reading the newspaper stuff, trying to play it down. That He considers it a great success. <laughs> Still talking about it. And he's in the Broadcasting Hall of Fame, by the way. He went on and continues to have a career, you know. Steve Dahl's still around. And it's just one of those crazy things, man. Just one of those crazy things. But was Disco Sucks just rock fans fighting back? Or was Disco Sucks about something more sinister? And that's a question I cannot answer. I was not there. I was alive, but I wasn't really making memories yet at that point. So I don't know. Little column A, little column B. What's interesting, though, is that after Disco Demolition Night, like almost immediately, Disco began to disappear, man. So July 21st, 1979, this is a couple weeks later, the top six records on the U.S. charts are disco records, all right? Fast forward a couple months later to September, there's no disco in the top ten. This stuff fell off a freaking cliff, man. And a lot of people say Disco Demolition Night was a big driver of it. Like, disco stations didn't want to play disco anymore. There's this huge public kind of backlash, you know? Things are getting violent. So, a lot of people say Disco Demolition Night actually drove a nail into that coffin. Now, other people say... Disco is already beginning to fade out. Again, right back to Saturday Night Fever. As soon as you make this acceptable mainstream, it kills what made it cool and revolutionary, right? And there are people who are really frustrated by Saturday Night Fever because this is not straight white boy culture, you know? 
This is about diversity and sexual liberation and freedom, you know, and equality for people, regardless of color, sexual orientation, whatever. This is not just about dancing in the clubs, man. This is about a safe kind of community where people are welcome, again, like the counterculture, to express themselves. And when that gets commandeered, when that gets taken over by the mainstream, it loses all of the impetus that made it a thing for the people who kind of invented it. I don't know, man, but it's compelling to look at. And it's so interesting to me, as a history person, to look at an event like Altamont or an event like Disco Demolition Night and just dig a little bit underneath it. Try to see what's there, you know what I mean? And what's there is potentially, you know, pointing at bigger, wider, deeper social, cultural issues. And it is compelling that the country seemed to go pretty hard conservative thereabouts. You know, we come into the 80s, we come into Reagan, Republicans in the White House, this kind of stuff, the rise of the religious right. Was it connected? to disco? Was it connected to this lifestyle, this subculture, which seemed to chip away at the foundations of what they considered traditional American values in society? Really funny, because America's built on this, this premise of, you know, pursuit of happiness. Freedom, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But only if that pursuit falls in line with how I see things. <laughs> So if you want to be a gay person, or if you want to, heaven forbid, dance with someone of your own gender, however you define your gender, in a nightclub, that's not okay, man. <laughs> and we still fight that fight now. And I'm not giving an opinion either way. I'm just presenting some of the ideas as I encountered them. And I encountered all of this just by looking at the cars. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun, man? I'm looking at the first Cars record, and then we wind up getting these weird new superficial histories out of looking into that. And I think that's kind of cool. Now, I got to say, as I wrap this thing, and I got to wrap this thing because I'm about to do some road work and I got a lot to get together. I'm getting a lot of nice feedback on the superficial histories, and I want to say how much I appreciate it. All right. I want to thank everybody who has written in to say they really enjoy these kind of takes on things. And I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen, all right? I don't know if I'm going to do, like, occasional superficial histories. <laughs> We're still making this up as we go along, all right? But I am a history person, and I really do like looking into this stuff. And it sounds like you guys like it, too. And that warms my cockles. So there will be more superficial histories. I don't know if that'll be, like, an every week kind of thing or once a month, or something like that, or whenever they come along, I guess, whenever I encounter something that strikes me as a compelling superficial history. So we'll see. And let me know. You know, let me know if you're enjoying this new kind of episode, if you'd like to hear more of that. If there's stuff you want me to take a shot at, that's interesting too. Or if you want me to do a different sort of episode, you know, let me know what it is you want to hear, and I'll see if I can indulge, all right? But I am about to do some road work, and all that means is that things could get spotty on the podcast, all right? This is very much a labor of love. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if it's a labor of that half of the time, but it's a labor. Gotta tell you, it's a labor, and it is, you know, by the traditional metrics, not a paid one. So sometimes I gotta put it in the background while I go do the paid ones. <laughs> so I got a bit of road work coming up which means I might miss a few weeks here and there on the podcast. And if that happens, I don't want you to be alarmed, all right? This is not a hiatus. I'm just working. <laughs> so I shall do my best to deliver podcasts while I'm doing road work. It's not always easy to do, all right? I don't have my normal setup with me for recording. And, you know, schedules are schedules. And I don't know if I'll have time. And particularly these superficial histories actually take quite a lot of research. It takes time, and I will have some van time, I suppose, but maybe not internet. I don't know. So it could be tricky for me to get episodes together that are worth sharing 
or finding the time to record them and edit them and the internet to upload them. <laughs> a lot of question marks podcasting on the road. All right, but I'm going to try. There might be short episodes. I don't know what they might be. But if I miss a few, don't worry, okay? Don't be alarmed. I'm still here. I'm just working, all right? But before we go, a couple things you need to check out. Always got to give you stuff to check out. Samantha Fish. Her record has been released. The record is called Faster. It includes the tune Twisted Ambition, which I love so much. One of my favorite songs of the year. And this is a cool record, man. Samantha Fish is, you're never quite sure what you're going to get from track to track, to be honest. I mean, she used to be mostly a kind of blues rock thing. It's become much more than that. Uh, more is the wrong word. It's become much broader than that, I guess. She's a great guitar player. There's a lot of great guitar stuff happening, but there's like soul and some pop and some country. There's a bunch happening on this record faster. But if you liked Twisted Ambition, then by all means, go check out the full record because it has been released and it's really cool. Now, for you old school punk fans, since we're talking punk, not like vintage old school, but more recent old school, the great and mighty and powerful Face to Face has released a brand new record also in the last couple of weeks. No way out but through. If you are into melodic, fast, SoCal punk music, Face to Face is such a great band, man. Such a great band. And they've been just releasing great records for 30 years. <laughs> face to Face. So if you want to check out something that's a little heavy, a little driving, some punk stuff, nobody does it better than Face to Face does it. So go check out No Way Out But Through. That is the new Face to Face album. And I'm going to check out now, man, because i got to get myself together and get ready to do some road work. So thanks for listening, as always. And thanks for the feedback. I appreciate it. Let me know what you're listening to. Let me know what you want to hear on this program. And do not forget, good things happen when you put yourself out there, okay? Take a shot on something, kids. Take a chance, all right? Something you want to create, something you want to try, something you want to do, someplace you want to go. Do it! Because good things happen when you put yourself out there, okay? I'm going to check out. Thank you once again. I will be back soon, exactly when I'm not sure, but hopefully next week. If not, perhaps the week after that. Not a hiatus, just busy, okay? So until next time, I'll check you later. Yeah. Stay on alive.